This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. If you click on the link in the description below, it'll take you to their store and they'll know I sent you there. Hello everyone, I'm Need to Hone, and it's Wednesday, so that means it's time for another MTG Top 10, the series where I rank cards based on their historical performance and Magic's highest level of competition. Zendikar Rising preview season is underway, and that got me interested in taking a look back at our very first visit to Zendikar, which was released in October of 2009. I considered looking at the entire block, but because Zendikar is a set that is supposed to feel more like the original adventure environment of pre-Eldrazi Zendikar, I thought it was fitting to look only at original Zendikar. To be eligible for this list, a card had to receive its original printing in Zendikar. That means cards that were reprints in Zendikar don't count. I also excluded the fetch lands because as multi-format staples they are an obvious number one and they're so ubiquitous that I don't think I need to tell you about them. In all, that means 215 cards were eligible for this list and in this video, we'll talk about the 10 that have left the biggest impact on tournament magic. Before we get started, a quick reminder on how I score cards in these videos. A Pro Tour, Mythic Championship, Players Tour, as well as Legacy or Vintage Championship Top 8 are worth 2 points, and a Grand Prix, Mythic Invitational, or Magic Fest Top 8 is worth 1 point. Alright, let's get to number 10. At number 10, it is Bloodgast, a creature with Landfall. Lands are a big theme every time we visit Zendikar, and Landfall is really the plane's signature mechanic, since it has only ever been given an ability word in Zendikar sets. Bloodgast never stays dead for long thanks to its landfall trigger. It just keeps coming back and doing damage to your opponent, which is a pretty powerful thing. Most decks it sees play in never actually pay the mana to cast it either. I mean, why would they? Instead, he has found the most success in decks that load up the graveyard and get him into play the first time by simply playing a land. Bloodgast only saw very modest play in standard, putting up one Pro Tour top 8 there. Extended would be where it would first see play in the deck that made Bloodgast such a powerhouse, and that's Dredge. Dredge decks can easily load up the graveyard, and milling your Bloodgasts means you get them back without ever paying mana for them. It has also seen play in Dredge decks in Extended, Legacy, Vintage, and Modern. It gained a lot of points in Modern over the last year or so, because several graveyard-heavy decks running Faithless Looting have been dominant. This included things like Hollow One, Vengevine, and Dredge. As you probably know, Dredge decks were pretty broken in Modern for several months last year as a result of Hogak, and Bloodgast went along for the ride. Both Looting and Hogak have now been banned, so Bloodgast has slowed down in Modern. However, he's continuing to see play in Dredge decks in Legacy, so Bloodgast seems likely to continue to put up points and he may even move up the list going forward. At number 9 we have a Wrath Effect, Day of Judgment. It is a strictly worse Wrath of God because it doesn't keep creatures from regenerating, but in formats that didn't have access to Wrath of God or other powerful sweepers, it was pretty successful. This included the extended format of 2011, where Day of Judgment was played in both White Weenie and Blue White Control decks. It also has a single point in a modern Tron deck. Standard, though, is where it saw the most play, of course. It was predominantly featured in white control and mid-range decks, like Cobblade, Esper Control, and Blue-White Delver. And number 8, it is Disfigure. Most standard formats have a very efficient 1-mana removal spell that can take down smaller creatures. Frequently, that is a red card, like Shock, but Zendikar also gave Black a good spell for this in Disfigure. It is a simple card to be sure, but it's also quite powerful. A 1-mana instant that gives something minus 2, minus 2 is great, because it means most of the time you'll be trading up, that is, killing something that costs more than the one mana you spend. That kind of tempo can give you the edge you need to win a game. The fact that it's an instant increases your chances of outvaluing your opponents too, since you can use it in response to anything they might be trying to do to one of their creatures. It can't damage players like Shock can, but it trades in that ability and gets something else. It can be used in combat to weaken a creature larger than 2-2, and then you can block it with one of your creatures to take down something even larger, frequently without losing your creature at all. So yeah, this figure is good. When it was originally printed in Zendikar, it was played in basically all the black decks, whether in control decks like blue-black control, or more aggressive decks like vampires and infect. It received a reprint in Core Set 2020, so it's actually legal and standard right now, although it is about to rotate out. Like the last time it was in Standard, this figure has been played in a lot of different black decks, including Sultai Control, but also the more creature-based Sacrifice and Adventure decks. 
It has been successful outside of Standard 2, appearing in a variety of black decks in Modern. While it is by no means a staple there, it does see play there intermittently, and that is likely to continue. Creatures even get disfigured in Legacy, where it's been played in decks like Delver, Storm, and Sultai Midrange. Disfigure is likely to continue to gain points, and is also the kind of card that could easily be reprinted in just about any set, so I imagine it will only move up this list going forward. At number 7, it is Punishing Fire, a burn spell that, well, punishes opponents who gain life. Two mana to do two to something is not the most efficient deal, since we often get that much damage for one mana, but the recursion here is a big deal. While it was definitely printed to be a card to help red decks overcome life gain decks, Punishing Fire ended up being a card that was easily abused in formats outside of Standard. This first occurred in Extended, where it was combined with Grove of the Burn Willows to force opponents to gain life, allowing you to return Punishing Fire to your hand every single turn and either use it to kill your opponent's small creatures or as a mana sink that ended up doing one damage a turn to your opponent. That engine is powerful enough that it has long been a defining aspect of the Legacy format, where it's most frequently utilized in Maverick and Lands decks. It even sees some play in Vintage, showing up in some Oath of Druids decks. Punishing Fire is likely to continue to gain points going forward. At number 6, it is Valakut, the Molten Pinnacle. Valakut is part of a cycle of lands in original Zendikar that give you extra value when you play enough lands with the right type. In the case of Valakut, you get a free Lightning Bolt for every mountain you play after your fifth. In Standard, Valakut ramp decks look to quickly get lands into play and then gain control of the game once they could put multiple mountains into play at a time. Valakut's real power comes as a result of its combo potential, though. In Extended, it was combined with Scape Shift, which was essentially a ramp deck, but one with a combo win. You could cast Scape Shift and search up all your mountains and Valakuts. With them all coming into play at the same time, all of your Valakuts check to see how many mountains are on the table. It sees that there are more than five, so every mountain you search up does three damage for each Valakut. That is a powerful combo, because it's basically a one-card combo. You just ramp your way up and then scape shift make sure you have the necessary mountains and Valakuts to win the game. It didn't have that much time in Extended though, as the format would be retired the same year that the scape shift deck made its debut. Valakut was a concern when the modern format first began, and it started that format on the banned list. However, that ban only lasted a little bit over a year, and ever since it was unbanned, scape shift decks have been one of the top decks in all of modern. Other decks run Valakut in the format too, in particular Primeval Titan decks, which usually only run a singleton copy, but it can be tutored up when it is the most potent. Like a lot of cards on this list, Valakut is likely to gain more points going forward. At number 5, it is Goblin Guide, one of the best one-drops in the entire game. A 1-mana 2-2 with haste is some serious business. Serious enough that it comes with a downside. When it attacks, your opponent gets to draw the top card of their library if it's a land. That's a real downside, make no mistake, but the decks that play it aim to kill the opponent before they can ever take advantage of the extra cards they get. It also gives you a little bit of information about your opponent's hand and deck. In Standard, the guide was played in a variety of aggro decks like Landfall, Naya, and Boros, but it was also played in more typical red deck wins decks. Modern has been where he's really thrived, being one of the best turn one plays for decks like Burn, Death, Shadow, and of course, red deck wins. The guide doesn't have any points in 2020 just yet, but it seems pretty unlikely it will go the whole year without adding to its score. And number four, it is Expedition Map, a card which really reflects a lot of what original Zendikar was about, exploring. The map lets you tutor up lands, which is a flavorful representation of what a map can help you do. In terms of gameplay, the map is powerful because it has the ability to tutor up any land, not just basic ones. That's especially useful in decks that try to assemble the Tron lands, as it makes it much easier to have that 7 mana on turn 3. That is of course the whole plan in one of the decks that has been in the top tier of modern since the format was created in 2011. It also has a few points in Legacy where it is used to tutor up Dark Depths or Thespian Stage, whichever card for the combo you might need. It also has some points in Vintage, coming in Goblin Charbelcher decks, where its only purpose is to make sure you get the one land out of your deck before activating the Charbelcher. While it hasn't had success in Eternal formats in a while, it is going to continue to be a major force in Modern. And number three, it is Ravenous Trap, which comes with the Trap subtype. On most adventures, one encounters obstacles, and on Zendikar, traps guard all the best treasure. In the game, traps can be cast for their normal cost, or they can be cast for a significantly discounted cost if your opponent meets certain requirements. Ravenous Trap is a great card for hating on the graveyard because it allows you to take out your opponent's entire graveyard for zero mana. 
That's assuming three or more cards go into the graveyard from anywhere, but that isn't that big of a requirement against graveyard decks, especially those looking to abuse dredge. It has been played in any format that has a dredge deck, with vintage being where it has done the most work. It did gain a ton of points in modern in the recent past as a result of Hogok decks dominating the format, but with the banning of Hogok, it probably won't be putting up points at such a high rate going forward. And number two, it is Mind Break Trap. Ravenous Trap hates on one of Magic's most powerful mechanics, Dredge. Well, Mind Break Trap hates on what is arguably the game's most busted mechanic, Storm. It's very difficult to keep a Storm player from going off. That's why it's such a dominant deck in the internal formats. But Mind Break Trap does that for you. Like Ravenous Trap, it can be cast for zero mana. Sure, it takes your opponent casting three spells in a turn, but if your opponent is trying to kill you with Tendrils of Agony, well, they're going to have cast a ton of spells. Because of how Storm works, countering the copy your opponent casts doesn't stop the Storm copies, but Mind Break Trap does, because it just exiles any and all spells from the stack. This means that all the spells your opponent casts to rip through their library and gain mana don't matter, because now Tendrils of Agony isn't doing anything. Obviously, this is devastating for a Storm player, who have a hard time winning if Mind Break Trap resolves. As a result, Mind Break Trap sees a lot of play in Magic's most powerful formats, Legacy and Vintage, where Storm is at its strongest. And at number one, it's Spell Pierce, who has a massive lead over everything else on this list. Spell Pierce is an extremely efficient counterspell. It may only counter non-creature spells, and it may even offer your opponent the option of just paying extra mana for that spell, but the efficiency here is well worth it. It's a staple in every Magic format it's ever been legal in, and that's enough for it to remain at the number one spot on this list, probably forever. Well, that does it for this MTG Top 10. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch future MTG Top 10s, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. If you want to catch up on the over 300 MTG Top 10s I've already done, you should see the playlist on your screen now. Thanks for watching.